Absolutely. We, um, we diminish, we limit ourselves, we um, live on the surface if we don't explore and um, revalue our lives as creative individuals. Welcome to the Quotidian Podcast. I'm Bradley Dennis. Dr. Mary Antonia Wood is a scholar of archetypal depth psychology and the author of the new book, The Archetypal Artist, Reimagining Creativity and the Call to Create. Her work and focus are actually among the principal resources that I claim as inspiring this show and many of the topics that I curate here, namely a reinvigoration of meaning and a connection to the psyche through the creative process. Dr. Wood is the chair of the Depth Psychology and Creative Life Program at the Pacifica Graduate Institute and is an accomplished visual artist whose work draws deeply from both the surrealist bricolage movement as well as the feminist symbolism of seminal painters such as O'Keeffe and Cornell. Her work reflects a deep interest in the eternal mysteries of existence. She has said of her work, it is an act of discovery, a journey through mystery, through legend, and through myth. It's a sort of spiritual archeology span which eventually leads to the barest elements, the hidden essence within. And it's a fitting description of her work as a scholar as well. She is an absolute encyclopedia of creative philosophy and reference whose breadth of knowledge continues to astound me at every turn. So we spoke about the shamanic origins of human creativity, the role of the artist in this growing social and political movement and space, and about her middle name and the power that she derives from her Hispanic heritage. This podcast is produced by Carolina Commons, which exists to foster the creative spirit in individuals, in teams, and in communities, to encourage good faith communication, and to lift the human condition towards finding meaning and purpose. To learn more, please visit carolinacommons.org. And if you like what you hear and you want to support our work, we could use the help. Please check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the quotidian, and you'll receive great gifts, exclusive content, and as always, the chance to be on the show. We are absolutely grateful and indentured to your listenership and welcome your feedback and support now more than ever. So please enjoy the beautiful depths of a deeply and fiercely creative spirit, Dr. Mary Antonia Wood. Dr. Mary Antonia Wood, welcome to The Quotidian. Thank you, Bradley. It's great to be here with you. It's great to see you again. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your new book, The Archetypal Artist. Well done. It's a beautiful read. Thank you so much. It was a labor of love, uh, many years in the making, and um, i am been so gratified by the comments um, that I've been receiving recently from fellow artists, creators, and makers um, so thank you so much for acknowledging that. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a, it's a wonderful combination of the material that you, you teach in your graduate program, and, and it's obviously based in your experience as an artist. And so I'm really curious to, to hear you talk a little bit about the do. But before, um, before I ask you about the book and about your experience, I'm really curious about your middle name and the origins of your middle name. I immediately thought of Willa Cather, but I'm not sure that that's, is that the origin of it? No, not inspired by um, Willa Cather, but um, my heritage is Mexican. Uh, my mother oh. is from Mexico. I grew up 10 blocks from the um, international border in wow. Arizona with most of my family, yeah, on the Mexican side. 
So um, I'm, as fate would have it, one of those um, sort of crossroads people that I talk about in the book. Yeah. That sensibility that um, tends to be handed to us no matter where we grow up, if we grow up on the frontier or elsewhere. Yeah. So on your mother's side, um, what part of Mexico was your mother mother's family of uh, origin? Uh, from Sonora, right okay. um, along the border on the other side of um, of the wall, actually. Yeah. Um, wow. The area where I grew up, the small towns um, along southeastern Arizona, are some of the places where the infamous um, Trump wall has gone up and yeah. continues to go up. It wasn't like that when I grew up. There was, of course, always a border, um, mm -hmm. always a... Um, a physical line and a um, metaphorical line, if you will, between mm -hmm. the two. But now it is um, something much different. It is very um, frightening, and I think it's meant to be that way. Um, it's very difficult to to go back and see that. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely yes. an imposing symbol. Well, that's fascinating. That's, you know, I've gotten to know you a little bit over the last couple of years and I would never have guessed. I I went I went with the the literary reference, <laughs> but not the heritage. So that's fascinating. <laughs> Do you feel a strong connection to that side of of your identity and does that ever influence the work that you create? It does, absolutely. You know, before like so many people, I've lived many lives in this one life. Mm -hmm. And uh, long before I ever found myself studying depth psychology, um, having the opportunities to teach it, um, combined with studies in creativity, um, I was an artist known in the Chicana and Chicano circles in the Southwest, um, in New Mexico primarily, where I lived for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a, um, and s still is, a very uh, important part of my life as a working artist, a visual artist, um, a collaborator with other artists, where much of my inspiration, many of the themes I explored, were themes explored by um, Mesoamerican cultures, um, themes of... Um, what lasts? Um, why, why do we do the things that we do? Why bother with art? Why bother uh, with poetry? Um, these were the sorts of things that the philosophers, the, the wise people, the, um, the healers, the artists of Mesoamerican cultures um, struggled with in their time, much as we do now. And what were some of the answers that you came up with? Why poetry? Why art? Why well, creativity? I can um, can I move into that with um, with a couple of quotes from some of the people who've influenced me. Um, I have on my mind right now um, Bell Hooks, um, inspired by her wonderful book Art on My Mind. Toni Morrison. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. with a very prophetic piece that she did an interview for The Nation in 2015. Uh, along these questions, I also think of Camille Paglia, the um, art historian, cultural critic, mm -hmm. and James Hollis, the um, well-known Jungian analyst, writer, and speaker. So let me... Um, yeah... Let me answer that question with some thoughts here from these um, luminaries. Yes, yes. So setting us up, thinking about our moment in time, um, which was not so different from what Toni Morrison considered in 2015, um, she wrote about the rise of authoritarianism, um, prophetically, something that we're seeing even more uh, dramatically today. And she has a list of three 
strategies that oppressors, despots, and authoritarians use. So number one was select a useful enemy and other to convert rage into conflict, even war. Number two, limit or erase the imagination that art provides as well as the critical thinking of scholars and journalists. And number three, distract with toys, dreams of loot, themes of superior religion or defiant national pride that enshrines past hurts and humiliations. And then Hooks, writing probably around that same time, um, pondered, um, that if one could make a people lose touch with their capacity to create, lose sight of their will and their power to make art, then the work of subjugation or colonization is complete. And then Paglia, whose um, statements appear um, very early in the introduction to my book, observed that art serves as the voice of liberty requiring nurture without intrusion. Art unites the spiritual and material realms. And in an age of alluring magical machines, a society that forgets art risks losing its soul. And then finally, Hollis, James Hollis, from his um, Tracking the Gods, the place of myth in modern life, the artist is often the carrier of the mythological project, the one who from the intersection of conscious intent and unconscious patterning makes the myth of the age. If we are to read the ciphers of our time, to decipher the mythic texture that lies just beneath the surface, we're obliged to attend to the artistic voices around us. So those four voices among many um, were very instrumental to me um, in considering the power of art, the necessity of creative practice for both um, quote-unquote professional creators and artists mm -hmm. and everyone else. Um, to, yes, to limit, um, to yeah. sideline, to diminish the um, truly transformational power of art is to... Um, step closer toward that subjugation and colonization that Hooks talks about. It's eerie to look back at how the arts of ancient peoples yes. um, or peoples of the Americas were wiped out, were destroyed, um, and see now in our time the diminishment of artistic voices. Um, and that some of that comes from, from ourselves, um, from artists um, in community with other artists. Mm -hmm. And it seems that those points by those four authors are more salient than ever right now. And it seems like the work that you're doing both in the scholarship with your book, but also the program in which you teach uh, at Pacifica Graduate Institute that you are instrumental in helping connect artists back to source in a lot of ways, to reminding not just sort of the entertainment and maybe superficial pastiche that our culture and society has moved to turn art toward, but rather the transformative power of it the sustaining power of it, the inspirational power of it. Absolutely. We, um, we diminish, we limit ourselves. We um, live on the surface if we don't explore and um, revalue our lives as creative individuals. And mm -hmm. that includes um, linking back to the artist's lineage in the ancient shaman. Mm -hmm. um, that is a figure that um, made its appearance in this book. I did have a, 
a thread or two that I wanted to follow, but it became a very mm-hmm. prominent thread throughout all the chapters. Um, the historic evidence... So for folks who aren't mm-hmm. familiar with that term, can you give kind of an overview of, of the shaman and the role the shaman played in traditional cultures and um, and its links to to modern yes, artistry yes, and creative work? Um, the shaman is still very much um, alive. Um, shamanism is a living tradition in various cultures, um, mostly non-Western cultures or non-dominant cultures in this hemisphere. And um, the mm-hmm. shaman, shamana, uh, again, goes by many names, is a, a medicine person, a healer, someone who is charged with um, the health of the community. Um, a visionary, um, one who is mm-hmm. able to, like the psychopomp, which is the, uh, the Greek term for a guide of souls, one who through, mm-hmm. um, through training, through um, oftentimes very difficult uh, experiences of, of sacrifice, of suffering, of loss, experiences a transformation. Um, that allows that person to um, to travel, um, to journey into different dimensions, different realities, um, much like a, a mystic, um, a prophet. Um, that individual returns with something healing, something revealing, something transformational. Mm-hmm. Um, while there is literal shamanism, which... Um, is something we need to be very respectful of, to not um, colonize, to not make those moves of um, appropriation. There is also a shamanic sensibility, and I I wanted to bring that out um, in this book for creators to understand the very true lineage um, that takes the maker, who is also the... um, the cipher of our time, to go back to Hollis's term, um, take them back mm-hmm. to the origins of the artist, maker, creator. And that, of course, takes us to the cave painters, to magicians, to sorcerers, to alchemists. Um, all of these figures, yeah. hermits, um, that occur in both world history and mythologies, those are the ancestors of today's artists and creators. Um, right. To know something about that, to feel that in yourself and have it confirmed. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was bring together a number of very authoritative and convincing voices on this idea of a shamanic sensibility. Of course, many contemporary artists do study something that we could call shamanism. They are working with elders. They're working within traditions Mm -hmm. with living um, shamanic practices. But that doesn't diminish the work that artists without those kind of opportunities or inclinations can do. There's something shared there, very important, a sharing between the artist, the healer, the prophet, the mystic, um, that is very vital for our time. It's um, probably the aspect of being a creator that is most um, sidelined because it is the most powerful. This gets back to that notion of the same avenue that the shaman or the griot or the hungun, the sort of the central healing figure of these cultures, they they mediate this vertical access of the spirit realm in order to, you know, with gaining visions, um, which in modern parlance might be akin to inspiration for an artist, right? This idea of of being an interlocutor of the spirit realm and understanding what it is that the horizontal realm needs. 
what's the connection between the shaman and and the soul and this idea of you know we talked about hillman a little bit um and and hollis certainly talks about this as well the anima mundi the the soul of the world and that connection to that and and allowing that to come through in a creative voice the crossroads is um actually turned out to be one of the key ideas that shows up later um, in the book one of the guiding um, ideas and images that mm -hmm. um, was not something i anticipated when i started but it seems to make a tremendous amount of sense to me that mm. the crossroads is a meeting place the artist is a meeting place of ideas of forces forces that are not under their right. control yeah um, one of the things that um, the beloved poet Stanley Kunitz um, said about being an artist is that there's no there's no set way to access the unconscious, that place of inspiration, whether we call it the unconscious, uh, depth psychological term, which is kind of a um, abstract, very abstract term, or we call it imagination, the spirit world, you know, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, there's no formula for that. But what the artist does is, um, through patience, through devotion, through risk taking, the artist becomes the crossroads. In Kunitz's words, the artist becomes a good host. Yes. The um, unconscious learns that um, you are there to... Um, to mediate, um, to facilitate, to um, come into relationship yeah. in the community, not dominate, um, not impose your willpower. It reminds me of uh, Anne Sexton's quote, um, ambition is the death of the poem, yeah, she wrote. Beautiful. And that idea of you, you arrive and then you get out of the way. Yes. <laughs> you become the vessel, right? You become the mediator or the mediated and in some cases. And to go back to your idea about yeah. the connection to soul, um, soul in both C.G. Jung's work and in, especially in James Hillman's work, is a mediator, the mediatrix. The um, Jung's idea of essay in anima, um, being in soul, um, this essay in anima is a reality between realities, between the um, essay and ray, which is the uh, matter and material world, um, the world, the physical world, and then the um, essay and intellectu, the, um, the world of, um, I would say intellect, but we tend to go uh, we tend to think of that as like human intellect or smartness or um, IQ, but in this sense, mm -hmm. it is um, the world of the ineffable might be a way to put that. Something that is um, unknown to us, the, um, mm -hmm. the mystery. So soul navigates that middle realm and that is where the artist can um, also find themselves, can also work in that realm. Um, having a foothold also in the material world and bringing something back. Um, one of the wonderful ideas that comes very early in the introduction in this book is from Jean Erdman Campbell, the wonderful modern dancer who was married to Joseph Campbell. Mm. Um, and Jean Erdman Campbell observed that the artist and the mystic are very much the same, except that the mystic does not have a craft. Mm -hmm. So Campbell, um, yeah, considered right. that. He found that very profound, and he elaborated further to say that... Um, the mystic can often um, spin off, in Campbell's words, can get lost in that um, experience of moving into different realities. But the artist always has um, um, 
a thread, if you will, like Ariadne's thread, back to um, the world. Um, the artist can dream with eyes open. That is another wonderful connection back to the shamanic spirit. Um, one that can dream with eyes open um, and return with something of um, transformational power. And it seems to me that the thread leads back to the the artwork that that the artwork is is the boon in this case to use Campbell's parlance right that, that going through that journey the the specific difference between the mystic and the artist as Erdman's talking about is that virtuosity the ability to 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 pull the Ariadne's thread right the mystic doesn't have that the mystic gets lost doesn't doesn't bring it back to <clears throat> doesn't necessarily weave something doesn't have that thing to show at the end to to give the rest of us who were waiting on on this side of of that the, experience. the weaving um, idea is important because um, there's a powerful statement in a book on um, shamanism as the beginning of arts by Andres Lomel, a book from the 1960s, I believe, mm -hmm. where he stated that there is no shaman without art. So something has to be made. Something gets elaborated. Mm. Or that um, process is not complete. And that is what um, artists, creators, makers, whatever uh, creative individuals, whatever term we use, that is that necessary step. That something gets made. Maybe it is an object, a thing. Mm. But maybe it's an experience as well. Um, and you would definitely resonate with mm -hmm. that from your performance background, that it, it can be something ephemeral. It can be um, a mm -hmm. theater piece, a dance, something that may never occur again in the same way, never right. be repeated. Um, so is, that, is this what we mean when we talk about archetypal creativity and the archetypal artist? Not necessarily. What I wanted to explore around that, around thinking about archetypes and archetypal theory, is whether there was an archetype uh, driving the artist, the creator, the maker. And mm -hmm. as you know, archetypes are dynamisms. They are potentials for expression. Yeah. They're not... Um, something that we can find or see or uh, put our hands on. We only experience them when they manifest in archetypal images. They, um, they also manifest in individual human lives. Right. So in, in thinking about this, I discovered that there are many archetypal styles, not just one for the artist creator. In looking to myth in particular, uh, there's a whole host, you mentioned tricksters earlier, of trickster figures. Very prominent um, archetypal patterning or style or direction mm -hmm. for some, many creative people, but not the only one. Um, you know, Lewis Hyde did the wonderful book, Trickster Makes This World, classic, right. fantastic um, work on that sort of motivation. But there's also the the creators and the destroyers, um, images and figures like um, Shiva of Hindu tradition, mm -hmm. Dionysus, um, right, Gaia as well. There's also the um, a patterning, a way of being in the world as a creator that is much like a great mother of giving birth. How many times have we heard um, artists talk about their mm -hmm. works as as children as birthing? Um, their work. Right. So I touch on at least four or five other um, constellations, if you will, of ways to be an artist that take us back to recognizable archetypal 
dynamics that are seen across cultures because we we're not all going to fit in the trickster um, mm -hmm. model as um, fun and also dangerous right. as that one is. Um, and sometimes I think we change as mm -hmm. we go through life. Perhaps a young artist identifies or strongly feels that trickster energy, but then something else um, takes over later. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about the destroyer archetype i mean obviously you you one thing is defined necessarily by its opposite in my <clears throat> recent conversation with the painter daniel domig he talked about intentionally sabotaging his paintings so that he would have to come back and fix them and that the, he creates this sort of palimpsest of experience as he's working. You know, he doesn't do sketches before he, he just goes. And sometimes he's starting with brushes that still have paint on them from his last canvas. And, and, and so this process is as much a destruction of, of the blankness, the whiteness, as it is the creation of something else that one can't exist without the other. And it's it wasn't until you actually put it in those terms that I realized that that archetype exists there and that it almost seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that that duality, regardless of what archetype you might identify with or you feel like you're inhabiting at the moment, you're also, by definition, defined by the opposite. Or you have them, um, they interplay with each other. Um, I'm thinking of one of Jung's most um, yeah. penetrating ideas about creativity, um, where he said that creativity is as much destruction as construction. Mm. Um, you know, that's a very Heracleitan um, kind of thought, who was an influence on Jung and Hillman and other depth psychologists, as well as a very Taoist um, sort of outlook. Um, where you have an interplay of um, not necessarily opposites, but polarities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm diving back into Heraclitus now with the current class that I'm teaching on creativity and aesthetic sensibility. And um, the idea of those intimate anta antagonisms, necessary antagonisms, which are like siblings. Um, two sides of the same coin, um, lovers, um, this play, mm -hmm. you know, if we look at um, traditions beyond the West, um, I'm thinking of Hindu traditions with the idea of Leela, the play of the gods. There is a, a, a playful um, warring even mm -hmm. that um, is life-giving, that is necessary, that must happen. Um, otherwise, you would have just stasis um, when you're talking about these um, ideas of polarities and opposites. Yeah. So, apart from the self-defined artist, the maker, the creator, the performer, what, in your mind and in your experience, can archetypal creativity and, for that matter, the creative process teach or inform um, the everyday experience? One good place to start answering that is with one question that uh, is central to this inquiry, something I've thought about um, for many years. And that is whether creativity is some sort of endowment or special gift, what sets the artist apart. Um, mm. Is the artist different from others? Is creativity available to all? Mm -hmm. And Jung's ideas on instinct, which were further elaborated by James Hillman, offered some really good insight 
into those questions for me. Um, so starting with Jung, he proposed that there were five vital instincts, um, an instinct toward hunger, sexuality, um, an instinct toward uh, movement out into the world, sort of an extroverted instinct, and also one of reflection. And then the fifth was uh, a creative urge, um, a necessary and essential aspect of creative movement, um, activity mm -hmm. in the human psyche. And in nature, in the world, of course, um, we're not separate the human psyche is not separate from the psyche of the cosmos, from the world around us that takes us back to the anima mundi that you mentioned earlier. If we use that, if we um, agree on that, um, then we can see ourselves having that same creative, um, I would use the word urge, but it's um, actually more like an ongoing activity. Um, whether we notice it or not, it is there. Uh, nature is always creative. The cosmos is always creating in its construction and destruction. Right. So Jung didn't go much further with that. Um, and this is according to James Hillman, um, who did go further with that and proposed that um, what might set the artist apart, the one that for some combination of um, deep longings, um, a feeling of necessity, a feeling of destiny um, to create, to make, what might be the difference there would be perhaps a clearer channel to that very human instinct. Um, so, so here we hold a couple of things that um, creativity is not a possession or a dispensation to a certain group of people called artists. It is available to all of us and it's extremely um, important if we just think back to those few quotes that I offered very important to be aware of one's creative nature, to create in the world, to make without the expectation that one need take on the role of artist. So that allows for much greater participation, human participation, in what some theorists you might recall Ellen DeSaniaki's theories, the um, evolutionary biologist um, who proposed that making, creating, um, her signature phrase was making special, Yes, was um, a type of behavior that was not linked to professional artists, but throughout time and the development of, of humankind, it became selected as an activity that led to our survival and to our thriving. Right. So um, again, we're kind of balancing these big questions um, of creativity for all, inherently in all. Yes. What makes the difference? Um, what sets a creative, a devoted creative life apart? There's also the, the understanding, I'm thinking back to your example of the shaman that you everyone understands the need for the shaman and the the use and the applicable skill but not you can't have a village full of shamans not everyone would survive the trip not everyone has the skills not everyone's um willing or able um, or if they are you know that they they may fail like there is a there is a process and i think that as i hear you talking about this and i think about my own experience and seeing friends and colleagues who 
who have or have not succeeded as quote unquote artists in our society a lot of that has to do with yes sort of how that term has been twisted currently but also what you're willing to endure right um that that to to truly like you're saying <laughs> like the Ann Sexton quote about getting out of the way and and yes the moment the artist has ambition they become a commercial artist i think in a lot of ways so we're talking about a, a more narrow subset of the term creativity as it has to do with that spiritual soul of of humankind of the world of the cosmos yeah we're, we're talking um, about both yeah the value of recognizing um our creative natures as human beings is number one. Mm -hmm. um, the foundational aspects of understanding of reimagining creativity. Um, there's a, yeah. a beautiful passage in some of Hillman's work where he talks about um, our lives as being our most important opus. That is um, the greatest creative work and one shared by all humans, the opus of our lives. Yeah. Uh, but next to that are the individuals that you're referring to, uh, people who do hear um, a profound and urgent, uh, arrestive calling um, to something like um, a service of the soul. It's not unlike taking vows in a um, spiritual tradition. Yeah. And Artists have spoken about this in their own ways um, for centuries. Right. There is a level of surrender, of sacrifice. Again, I always turn to the word devotion. And you touched on the fact that not everyone would want to do that or is potentially um, cut out for that or prepared for that. But it is a, it's a role that we... Right. Um, give lip service to at our peril, that artists um, are not um, people that we should turn to for wisdom, for transformation, um, mm. for the kind of um, bridge building that we need so desperately right now as the world um, faces not only the rise of authoritarianism, which I hinted at at the beginning, but certainly the climate crisis. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just read an interesting interview with um, the novelist Sandra Cisneros yesterday. I think it was in the New York Times. She's now living mm -hmm. in Mexico. It's been there for a decade or so. And... Um, she was commenting upon whenever there's a, um, a disaster or something, a tragedy in our lives, um, we call in the, um, the authorities, uh, the medical experts, the um, a list of you know, usual um, helpers that must come in yeah. when... You know, things as awful as like school shootings happen. And she was wondering why we never call in the poets. Right. Why don't we look to our poetic voices to help us um, heal, to help us come right. back together, to understand each other, to grieve together? Um, we don't. Um, we are missing a very important piece of our humanity when we push our artists aside. Um, and I'm, when I'm speaking of artists in that sense, I mean the type of individual who has devoted themselves um, in a way that would parallel this, the shamanic spirit of, of being in service to the community in the ways that mm -hmm. 
shamans were in the past and still are in traditions other than the dominant Western that, traditions. You're, you're leading me exactly where I wanted to take you, which is to talk a little bit about where where you see the role of the artist in our modern moment, given all that's occurring and what what this work in particular, this notion of archetypal creativity, how that can manifest or should manifest in in helping to to fight fight this both tyranny and, and sort of obfuscation of of our inherent sovereignty as creative beings. I think we need to realize our powers and not be convinced that um, art making is frivolous or it's a luxury or it's something that is done for um, mm -hmm. patrons who are well healed, um, who can afford um, to support the arts. I think it needs a, a very radical uh, reimagining of the kind of power, sacred power, magical power, sorcery, if you will, um, of the arts, of all of the arts. Take ourselves mm -hmm. seriously to begin with. If we want to be able to wield these powers seriously in the world. So one thing that comes to mind is um, the poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti, poet and publisher um, who died maybe with, within the last year. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he believed was that art is capable of a total transformation of the world and of life itself. And nothing less is really acceptable. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. So when you hear something like that as a creator, that's the kind of thing that can reorient, um, that can bring you back, that can wake you up. Um, mm -hmm. Creators are makers and artists, um, are the people who don't look away the people who, for as much as we can, of course, we're also human, but to our powers, um, we stay awake and we can awaken others. We seem like we're yeah. slumbering uh, toward the abyss, um, sleepwalking mm -hmm. toward an abyss. And my conviction is that what we're missing in this mix, we've had plenty of rational conversations um, that don't seem to be going anywhere. What we need is a dose, a big dose of the irrational, what the artist can bring. A type of... Um, what uh, the poet Hakim um, Bey would call poetic terrorism. Something. The idea of unmediated, just spontaneous <laughs> imagination yes, liberation. Yes, and to that... Um, there's um, D.H. Lawrence, a, um, a passage that I included in the book because it is so powerful mm. and so in tune with what you just said. Um, in a work that he did around Walt Whitman's poetry, Lawrence proposed mm. that the essential function of art is moral. It's not aesthetic, not decorative, not a pastime or recreation but it's a passionate, implicit morality that's not didactic, but it's the kind of morality that can change the blood rather than the mind. It changes the blood first, and the mind follows later in the wake. You are the Swiss army knife of artistic scholarship. <laughs> you have such a wonderful... Um, breadth of knowledge on on the subject. It's a real pleasure to to get your perspectives on this. Thank you, Bradley. That I think was one of them. You're very welcome. I have one more question for you, as we close up our hour. 
what is the question that's not being asked right now? The question that is not being asked for me, for you, and for your listeners is what are you going to do about this? Now that you have considered what we've talked about, you artist, fellow artist, creator, maker out there, you Bradley, me, Mary, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? today, tomorrow, to reimagine and reclaim your powers as a creator. And what's your answer for yourself, Mary? Where does your work lie? The tension for me right now, the question leads to a tension of the work that I love with others Mm -hmm. um, helping them find this power within themselves um, to renew their vows, if you will, um, or to make them for the first time if they're just now realizing that this is their destiny. Mm. There's a tension in um, being called to that and also the need to retreat from that into more private contemplation and making. It's probably a tension that many of your listeners feel as well, especially those that work with others and love that work. Mm -hmm. um, you may recall that the wonderful poet Mary Oliver, some of her advice to creators was to never take a real job don't get a manager's job. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, she would get up at five in the morning and write till seven or eight and then go to work at the post office. Or um, she was a, a teacher, co-teacher. Um, she did many things, but she was very careful to guard her gift, guard that um, necessary mm -hmm. and sacred time. The image that's coming to me is of someone making sure that everyone's able to wake up in time to see the sunrise. Don't sleep through it. It's gorgeous. Even though there's going to be another one tomorrow, don't miss this one. Yes, absolutely. And it, yeah, it takes a, a person getting up before the dawn to alert everyone to the dawn. It's someone who can... Um, see in the dark, if you will, has a little bit of, um, of night vision in that um, place that, that most um, would rather not mm. tread into. So, well, thank you for that, Mary. That's beautiful. So before I let you go, is there anything that you'd like to announce or... Uh, how could people get a hold of you or find you online? Um, anything in particular that you'd like to? Um, yes, let me do that very briefly. But at the very beginning of our conversation, you asked about my heritage. And I told you about um, my fascination with Mesoamerican yes. art and philosophy. And um, I'll give you just a little plug. But then I would love to end with um, a fragment of a poem a Mesoamerican poem written by um, a creator, uh, anonymous creator, probably from the 14th, 15th century. Hmm. So, um, yes, the book, The Archetypal Artist, Reimagining Creativity and Call to Create, uh, was published by Rutledge uh, in March. Um, it is available at all the usual places. Um, and I hope to be doing additional programs for the general public. I had a beautiful program this past summer uh, with this under the same name for a group mm. of diverse and amazing people from all over the world. We were together for six weeks every Saturday um, doing private work in between and coming together for discussion 
each Saturday. So I'm hoping to do another version of that through Pacifica's retreat center, Pacifica Online, uh, which is such a wonderful, welcoming mm -hmm. and um, really dynamic wonderful. platform. Well, take us out with, uh, with some um, well, Mesoamerican you. poetry. I will. Oh, my heart, you must be strong. Love the sunflower, the flower of the one God. Are we here on earth for nothing? The sunflower fades, the sunflower dies. I fade, I die. I, coyote hungry for wisdom, I say, we are only a little while here, not forever on earth, not forever on earth. Only a little while. Though it is jade, it will be broken. Though it is gold, it will be crushed. Though it is quetzal feather, it will be torn apart. Not forever on earth. Not forever on earth. Only a little while. Who will know my name? At least my songs. At least my flowers. What is there to do? Are we here on earth for nothing? At least my songs, at least my flowers. Hmm. Thank you, Mary. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you and to hear you share your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bradley. It's been my pleasure. Ah.